Amen. So I'll start with a review. We looked at three different structures we've been given. Now, last year we began to teach this third structure. We titled it In God We Trust. I'll explain why in a moment. The first structure is modern Israel. This one is key because it is our story. It's our Alpha and Omega histories. with this middle history as well. To that was added the structure of the counterfeit. Which meant all we had so far is our story and the story of the papacy. But the papacy is not the main player at the end of the world. Certainly not in the glorious land. So what I would suggest is the third structure is this study of In God We Trust. And the reason that we called it that it was because we didn't have a better name. We weren't sure the study was that important. And that title linked the two histories of failure. It covered the history of 1863, which led to 1888, and really the history to 1900. Where Adventists understand that there were efforts to pass a National Sunday Law. Then there was the 1940s and 50s. And then the history from 1979. In God We Trust was what they were trying to institute uh, in the first history, getting it printed on their money, that work was a, a, again attempted in the 1940s and 50s. When it also began to um, be printed on more money. And then also became their national motto. So th that phrase linked the first two histories of failure.
So noting its promise, uh, prominence, we just began to refer to that study as the In God We Trust study. There may probably be a, a more accurate name of what this study is trying to represent. Which are really three Protestant movements. Movements where they mobilise to take down a group threat. So there may be, um, it's probably a better name. We recognised then that this study without our intention was another study that brought up three histories. And again, the first two are failures, and we know the third will be success. So we have modern Israel, the story of Adventism, failure, failure, success. The story of the counterfeit, which is the papacy, which is failure, failure, success. And then we have the story of three mobilised Protestant movements. Failure, failure, success. It's this third one that we are focusing on at this camp meeting. So we began in our document, we worked our way through the introduction. And rather than read it all, we pulled out the key points. So I'm hoping everyone has a copy and has had the opportunity to read it. The points that we pulled out of the introduction we didn't really go into any further detail. Because this is just the short introduction before he's going to go into detail. But there's a few points we need to have in our mind. His first paragraph is really stating the whole point of this document. That, it, that is reflected in the title. Which is, how did the Constitution go from being, for a Protestant, a, a wicked, godless document to a Christian document. And then he says, this article is going to teach you that. Through the discussion of three movements, the three that we've written above. where the efforts change from amending the Constitution in 1888 history to instead how they interpret the Constitution in our history. This is the contrast part of his compare and contrast.
So we are already comfortable, I hope. But we should keep in mind that Adventists are not comfortable. When we say what will happen in our day, Amiga history, it is different to what they saw and expected in 1888 history. So in 88, 1888, when they're expecting an amendment to the Constitution, we should be comfortable to say that expectation will never be realised in our history. Because over the last 110 years, Protestantism has changed. And that's not just with their desire for a Sunday law. It's very hard to go online and find information about the Sunday laws. because that was like the fine print under their main goal. Adventists, contact, uh, Adventists concentrate on that fine print because it is the part that affects us the closest. But the goal was to amend the Constitution. And if you can recognise that the goal has changed, it should be simple to recognise that the fine print has changed. Because Adventists don't understand structures, They wouldn't accept that. But it's not just our, our structures which are, are so solid. If Adventism was to go to the world with a message, Those who know this history know that that's the case. Such as this author. This is the contrast. And the Sunday law, like the constitutional amendment, is part of that contrast. But then he says, we can also compare though. Because all three histories follow the same pattern. And he explains what that repeating pattern is. Now all three histories are a core, dominant, Protestant group that looks out of their bubble and sees a rising threat. They believe that they are the prototype of a true American. And to be American is to be the glorious land, the leader of the world. They have been blessed by God. 
So they see this threat. It's not just their personal religious status. This is now a nationalistic fight over their national identity. So they see the threat. They interpret that as an attack on the nation. And then they mobilize by going back to the constitution and making demands that are centered around that document. Whether they demand that it be amended or they demand that people interpret it their way. He discusses how the constitution has become the battleground where people read into that document whatever they personally want to. We discussed how Obama read that document which I think is, is in, a, in a good way. And we're ready to begin a, a more in-depth discussion of this first history. So that concludes our revision. So we're on page 265. Um, one, the fight to make the Constitution Christian. Now it's in this first part, this first history, where we are going to need almost all of our additional um, sources. because it's quite possibly the, the one we know the least. So this is when the other document and other quotes will come in most helpful. We won't go straight into the document because this document is trying to make a certain point it doesn't give a whole lot of the, the history that leads up to 1863 and that history I would suggest is relevant to us So I, I want to first make a couple of other points before we go to the document. This is the first quote um, from the Word document shared on the translation forum. It's a quote from the Evangelicals by Francis Fitzgerald. By the way, this author, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. So she's good at, she's good at what she does. So, 
When we look at 1863-1888 history, I'm just going to draw a box. This is the south of America. This is the north of America. And when we are discussing 1863-1888, it'll help us to locate where that fight was occurring. So, this is after the Second Great Awakening. There had been a revival in the north. The southern evangelicals held to the same standard as the north. But they did not have that social ethic. Religion was seen as a matter of the individual relationship to God. and to Christ as a personal saviour. What was strange was that this actually created a lot of unity in the South. The South's economy is based almost entirely on agriculture. It's largely rural. with small towns, small communities. Because of this limited economy, not many northerners migrate south. There's very little industry in the south. And very few immigrants are interested in coming to the South. So over decades, a, a stronger and stronger bubble forms around the South. It's white inhabitants were almost entirely from England or Scotland. not immigrants from other parts of Europe or anywhere. And those white inhabitants built the, the state schools. And most of the colleges. And they created in this South this culture where there was no separate intellectual class. A culture where no one questioned. Because there were so many things tightly connecting this southern community. With little impact from things like immigration or migration. So there's very little debate in the South. The Bible was an infallible guide and the church taught what was written in it. So by the time this bubble had formed, When a southerner came into contact with someone who believed differently, which was strange for them, they would conclude that those others were not Christians. 
So a southerner would not consider an Adventist to be a Christian. or even someone in their same denomination who believed differently to them. So this social cohesion combined with their growing um, unity on slavery the author says that by 1840 there was a South Southern identity. A Southern region as well. And she says this isolation lasted well into the 20th century. It didn't end by 1900. It, it was it retained its strength. And to some degree, there's remnants of it today. So by 1840, there was a South. And she suggests there wasn't a North and South. Because the North never had that cohesion, that unified identity. So there was a South and the rest of the country. Of course, we know this because by 1861, they think they are their own country. Because of this, now I'm not reading, I'm, I'm paraphrasing from different sources. There was not this fight in the South. You could argue the South already had its church state relationship. If you wanted to think that if the Alpha history had not been a history of failure, I think we could see that the 1850 compromise would have been successful. Which means the South would have been in control of power in the United States. And the South, from well before 1840, had developed a church-state relationship. A.T. Jones is going to lay out how the Drive for Sunday law progressed. by states and then through countries. He said Australia is the last place it reached. It began in the states. And in the states, it began in Arkansas. And then spread Mississippi, etc. The South had long been developing the church-state relationship. By the Civil War, it's impenetrable. From 1863, it begins to lose that Civil War. And now they have another thing uniting them. Pain, wounded pride. So even after the Civil War, 
they create an even an even stronger shield around their regional identity. An even stronger bubble. That's why she says that this bubble extends well into the, the 20th century. The point I'm making is that especially in 1863, but all the way to 1900, this is largely a northern fight. against church and state because in the south there hasn't really been a question. So as we go through this history, we are mostly discussing a northern fight. The south already had it in our alpha history. enough to already fulfill prophecy. The South fails. 1888, this is a northern fight. Impacting the South, of course. So, the document doesn't make that clear to us. Another point I want to make is going back to 1798. We're mainly discussing the Presbyterians. The Presbyterians had three major schisms in their history. Three major splits. The first split they had was in the First Great Awakening. back in the early 1700s, earlier. This was, this is called the old side, new side controversy. So old side like the conservatives, new side like those changing the message. First Great Awakening, Old Side, New Side Split. The second split they had was in the Second Great Awakening. which began around 1798 through to 1840. So the first split was the first great awakening and this is Old side versus new side. The second split was the second great awakening. And this was old school, new school.
again, it's those trying to change the message and those trying to conserve the message. And the third split, this occurred in the early 20th century, 1920s, 30s particularly. And this is known as the fundamentalist modernist controversy. Again, those trying to conserve the message, those um, progressives progressing with the message. The point I was trying to make in the Oceana series was that Protestantism has tended to not be united, but it is divided at least into two camps. Just as it is now, when you have churches opposed to Trump and churches that gave Trump power. It's just the same continuation of what has been this split issue in Protestantism since the early 1700s. We're not going to worry about the first one. But it's the second great awakening that also Adventism came out of. It's the second great awakening that introduced the concept of camp meetings. Up to 20,000 people attending camp meetings. By people such as Charles Finney. He was one of the key leaders of the Second Great Awakening. Adventism did not invent the camp meeting. That came from the Second Great Awakening. Most of Protestantism was doing that before we were. But we also took part in that. And Adventism is one of the two, with Mormonism, religions that came out of the Second Great Awakening. So just the two points we've made so far. Protestantism has been split through its history. This fight is largely in the north because the south had surrendered to church and state long before the civil war began. Another quote by Francis Fitzgerald. The Second Great Awakening was essentially a revolt against the Calvinist establishment. So as I said, we're ignoring this first one. It's not in our, 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 it's not in the time of the end. This one's in our Alpha history. What Protestantism, the highest creed of Protestantism,
was essentially Calvinism. I, I, I don't want to go into the complexities of why. But it's Calvinism that was the creed of Protestantism. So especially the Presbyterians, but the leadership she refers to as the Calvinist establishment. Who hold strictly to that Calvinism. And the Second Great Awakening was a re revolt against that. So the Second Great Awakening is not this history of unity within Protestantism where they're doing a great work. It's an internal fight. It's described as like the religious revolution after the American Revolution. Because a key doctrine of Calvinism was predestination. Now in the American Revolution, there was this revolutionary idea introduced that people had free will. They could decide for themselves on personal and political matters. So as they come out of the revolution, where they wake up to this newfound freedom, by the 1790s, people are starting to feel uncomfortable with Calvinism. that teaches you have no freedom to decide whether you go to heaven or to hell. God decided long ago and nothing you do can change that. Conflicts with the freedom they had experienced from the American Revolution. So some charismatic leaders rise up, and we mentioned before Charles Finney. He's described as a new school Presbyterian. He departed from traditional Calvinist theology by teaching that people have free will to choose salvation. So he says people have free will. In religious matters, as well as the political and the personal. It is in some ways an extension of the American Revolution. Now, he was one of the main leaders of the, this Second Great Awakening, the New School.
What about the old school? I don't want to so much concentrate on a person. As much as a university. The old school was led by Charles Hodge and these leaders change over, over time. And he was I'll go to the quote. It's the second quote from um, the document on the forum. The old school, led by Charles Hodge, halfway through the quote, of Princeton Theological Seminary was much more conservative theologically and did not support the revival movement. Led by Charles Hodge, of Princeton Theological Seminary. This may seem like a small point, but it's very hard to find information on such thing as, things as Sunday laws. It's hard to know from which direction that drive was coming from. But if you hear that something came out of Princeton, was taught in Princeton, you're looking at something that is strictly fundamentalist conservative. practically to the present day. This is the fundamentalist branch of Protestantism. It was conservative theologically, called for traditional Calvinist teaching. It did not support that revival movement. I'm just looking for a quote. I could have it for tomorrow. But one of the leaders of Princeton, he, he, he made the claim, the thing he was proud of the most that no new thought ever came out of that university. He was so proud that that university did not introduce a single new thought to Protestantism. Because they are fundamentalists, there is no new thought that could come. He was proud of that. Charles Finney was also associated with the university. His name became synony synonymous with Oberlin College. These are two colleges, universities. Both in the north, of course, that's where they're fighting. Princeton was started in 1812, still running today.
traditional Calvinist theologians established themselves at Princeton? And fought for fundamentalism from Princeton? They did that in this fight, but also especially in the third fight in the early 20th century. Oberlin College was established in 1833, directly connected to the Second Great Awakening. It's the first college in America that allowed co-education. The second in the world, still running today, that allowed co-education. Charles Finney insisted that they allow black students equally to white. He insisted that um, women should make their own decisions regarding salvation. This college became a stop on the Underground Railway. Now I don't want to suggest that we're all here in the new school and this is the good side. We're trying to trace the subject of the Sunday law or constitutional amendments. Wherever that church state drive is coming from. When these modernists start to change Protestantism, Part of what they are teaching is evolution, no literal second advent, no virgin birth, none of Christ's miracles actually happened, and the Bible is not historically accurate. We would not agree with this stream. We probably agree more with this stream. At least when we say virgin birth, real miracles. So there's issues with both. But the reason that this stream has problems is as they go into the Bible and, and question, they do not have a methodology to do that with. So they're going to, to just have a discussion about what they want to leave and what they want to keep. We work on a strict methodology that they don't have. So while we could argue they were trying to do a good thing, it led them to, to strange conclusions we would not agree with.
but this isn't about which side you would join if you were a Presbyterian, because you're not. We're tracing the threat all the way to the Sunday law. So now the three points we've made. Even the Great Awakenings were just fights within Protestantism. Fights that always work through these two sides. Essentially conservatives and liberals. From the 1700s through the 20th century. The South has already given in to church and state. Most of the fight when we discuss 1888 history is here. And when we're looking at 1863 to 1888, There's still these two sides at conflict, which we could simplify by just cutting down to two universities. And there were others. This isn't this is an oversimplification. but it's still accurate. This helps us when we read the document and he mentions something, for example, by the way, someone at Princeton was teaching this. You know what stream of Protestantism that's coming out of. That's not the 19th century Biden stream. This is the fundamentalists. And as far as the two sides who's winning, it changes through the history. In the Second Great Awakening, the New School did really well. They did really well here as well. Fundamentalists were essentially shut down in the 1930s. But then along comes Billy Graham. And which side was Billy Graham on? He's a fundamentalist. But he's clever. Partway his, through his career, he says, that term is loaded. I'm going to call myself an evangelical. A term that had fallen out of popularity. So the fundamentalists, the modernists thought they'd won. Fundamentalism was dead. But fundamentalism is resilient. Billy Graham then the 1960s and 70s. They are the ones that mobilise on radio. They know how to fight. And by this history, they're back in the game. B 
but going back into the, the first history, if you see Princeton or Oberlin, you know what side they're on. So I wanted to, I, I just wanted to, to give a, a, some introductory information from 1798 through the Second Great Awakening. The document starts our history in 1863 history. By which time the fight's in the north. There's long been this split within Protestantism. which we have summarised with two universities. Now we can come back to our document. And we're on 265, just under that heading. I want to work through this first portion fairly quickly and then go back. He's going to start in that paragraph saying that in the 1800s there was already this close unity between Americanism and Protestantism. At least in state laws there was already a mixture of church and state. But over the course of the 1800s, new faiths like Mormonism and Seventh-day Adventism developed. and the population of secularists and free thinkers. So, definitely by the time you get to 1844, everyone's worried about immigration. Because through immigration, a lot of Jews are coming into the country a lot of Catholics are coming into the country and then out of that second great awakening come Mormons SDAs And there's also the rise of a fifth group, titled Free Thinkers. So I want to define that in a moment. So he's starting his repeating pattern. The dominant Religious group are identifying there's a threat. That doesn't show on the zoom. I'll put it here. The threat they've identified to their Calvinist Protestantism is Jews, Catholics, Mormons, Adventists and Freethinkers.
I just want to explain free thinkers. If you were to go to Wikipedia, look up the golden age of free thought. It has its own Wikipedia page. This is the last quote on your document. This golden age was around the middle 1800s. It was a social political movement. It really started around the 1850s. They mark it around 1856. to World War I, 1914. It was particularly encouraged by a man named Robert Ingersoll. Social movements like the push for women's suffrage, the right to vote, and other political, scientific and social trends that clashed with religious orthodoxy. Caused people to question the traditional ideas about the world. And it became particularly popular when Charles Darwin published his Origin of the Species. Which he published in 1859. So 1856 through to World War I. There's this social political movement. Challenging traditional ideas. Some of them social, like women's right to vote. Which would be against a Protestant's view of Bible teaching. But also evolution. So it's this golden age of free thought that combined with Catholic and Jewish immigration and the rise of Mormonism and Seventh-day Adventism that wake up and mobilise Protestantism. to begin their first drive to defend their leadership through, through the government, through the political process. Last paragraph on page 265. In response to this threat from five groups of people, Protestants turned to the Constitution. 
They mobilised to amend it and make sure that their supremacy is inscribed into that document. This is led by members of the small covenanter sect of Presbyterians. We're going to come back to the covenanter sect. Came out of Scotland, John Knox. But we'll finish the, the whole section before we come back to them. A couple of sentences after where we finished reading. Actually, we'll just address those sentences. It attracted significant mainstream support. Thousands of followers. The support of a Supreme Court Justice. I have a document here which has his name. William Strong. Appointed to the US Supreme Court in 1870. She also says the nation's leading seminary. I would suggest that's Princeton. Princeton. In the face of challenges to prayer and Bible reading in public schools, Sabbath observance laws, blasphemy laws and religious oaths, the Christian Amendment Movement offered a simple solution. So, quoting straight from the document. The solution was to place an expression of Protestant faith in the Constitution. The movement declared the nation's religious identity could be permanently protect protected, resolving once and for all that the United States is a Christian nation and more specifically a Protestant nation. They never succeeded in, in that amendment. But the movement succeeded in gaining official recognition of the nation's religious identity in 1892. When the Supreme Court declared that the United States is a Christian nation, making it appear for a time that the movement had achieved through the courts what it had failed to win in Congress. And the religious right today still point back to that 1892 statement by the Supreme Court. As evidence that they, the religious right today, are on the correct side. They still use that. So to summarise... 
there's a split within Protestantism. It begins the fight. Um, one group in that split, the Covenanter sect, identify a threat from these five groups. They see themselves as a prototype of a true American. They mobilize, bringing elements of about 11 different Protestant denominations. And then they make constitutional demands to get their identity secured in the Constitution. That's an overview of the first history. In our next presentation, we're going to go into a little more detail of this first history. Into this covenant sect that drove for this amendment. Where they came from. and how they developed this argument. We'll close. If, if, if you kneel with me, we'll, we'll close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your Sabbath day. We see how you have led your your people all through this history. From 1798, as you've tried to create a group of people like ancient Israel, who would be a light to the world We see how much Adventism has failed. It's not teaching and understanding this history. Which is causing it to fail today to do its work. To identify and prepare people for the Sunday law. and for your return. May we not fail like they failed. We have loved ones, friends, family, who do not understand the significance of what is happening, what you are trying to do. I pray, Lord, you'll help us to reach them in your way, in your time, that none need be lost. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.